Oh, hasn't this been good so far? I so appreciate the worship with Elo and Stephanie. It's been amazing. Pam's encouragement, it just so lifts our heart. Praise God. You know what? We allow from Jesus. We get from Jesus. So let's allow even more right now. Heavenly Father, we want all that you have for us right there in our lives, in our homes, in our families, wherever we are, we want it all, God, your best. We're believing for your best. Right now, we receive your help by the precious Holy Spirit as he breathes on your word, Father, in our lives. And it will produce, it'll never return empty or void, but it will accomplish what you have already designed it to do in Jesus' precious name. We receive it. Say, I receive it. I receive it. Amen. You know, a mother was preparing pancakes for her sons. I love pancakes. Kevin was five, Ryan three. And the boys began to argue over who would get the first pancake. Who gets the first one? Well, their mother saw an opportunity for a moral lesson here. She said, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake and I shall wait. Kevin, the oldest, he turned to his younger brother and he said, Ryan, you be Jesus. You be Jesus. <laughs> How about today we all be like Jesus and enforce the non-negotiable boundaries that say no fear here in Jesus' name. No fear here. We're getting into this segment, part four, Take Back Your Rest. That's the subtitle, Take Back Your Rest. Previously in this series, we've learned fear is enemy number one, but perfect love evicts fear, God's perfect love. We learned that fear is a talker. That's right, it's a trash talker. Giants, storms, mountains, problems all like to be heard and trash talk, but faith is the antithesis to fear and shuts it down with God's spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Those are thoughts that are set above and not set on what's beneath. In a special masterclass on our website, I hope you got that, we learned from David the Shepherd Boy on how to slay giants, the giants of fear. Now, in this exciting segment, we're going to learn how to take back our rest. God wants you to take back your rest. You can do this now, today, starting tonight. Some of you are going, oh, thank God, I need this. It's essential. Because remember, 1 John 4, 18 says that fear has torment. Isn't that awful? Fear is torment. The enemy loves to torture people. He loves it. He wants to torture you, your family. He wants to torture your mind. His favorite tool, fear. He often uses a torture technique called sleep deprivation. The Geneva Convention and many other countries have banned the use of sleep deprivation as a means of interrogation because it's inhuman, it's dangerous, it's torture. No sleep equals death. Did you know that? And the enemy of your soul loves to use sleep deprivation on you and your family. Maybe you've noticed this. Maybe you've started, you're like, hey, wait a sec. I'm starting to see this happening in my life. How does sleep deprivation work? Well, let me tell you. Most adults need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Sleep deprivation leads to feeling moody, fatigued, irritable, depressed, forgetful, increased appetite, unmotivated. For some of you right now, you're going, oh my goodness, I can just, right there, that's my life. <laughs> well, listen to this. Here, there's more. It leads to tragic accidents involving airplanes, ships, trains, automobiles, power plants. It leads to lowered immune system, increased risk of chronic illness, increased fat storage, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, negative effects on your hormone production. You can accumulate what experts call sleep debt, sleep debt that must be reconciled. That means paid back. Increased feelings of worthlessness come from sleep deprivation. Inac feelings of inadequacy, low self-esteem and powerlessness. Negative effects on your short and long-term memory. That's what sleep deprivation does. Decreased problem-solving ability, decreased creativity and concentration, increased anxiety and poor balance all from sleep deprivation. Sleep is God's car wash for your brain. Did you know that? 
God has designed a brainwash to happen every night when we sleep. This wash removes toxins and promotes healthy brain function. There are toxic proteins that gather on the brain through the day, and this sleep helps wash it off. When you sleep, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, is released in pulsing waves to wash toxic memory-impairing proteins from off of your brain. The enemy counters by using fear, worry, to steal your sleep because he wants those toxins to stay stuck and rooted on your brain. He wants you impaired, foggy, struggling. The devil wants your brain toxic, impaired, depressed, and even working against you. Your enemy's strategy is to steal your rest. He wants to take away your rest. The covenant that God has given us is rest. It's so important. He wants to steal it from you. So how does he do it? He starts with a lie, a very simple lie, which is simply doubting a truth principle in your life. Does God love me? Will God provide for me? Oh, probably not. You know, God takes care of those who take care of themselves. Well, that's not me. God doesn't care about your safety, my safety, my family's protection. After all, God creates tornadoes, earthquakes, and destructive lightning storms, doesn't he? Right? He's coming after me. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Never, ever mess with my Heavenly Father's character. God is good. How? When? All the time. God is good all the time. His mercy is forever. It's everlasting. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, God is not willing that any, any should perish. Never build a doctrine off of experience. Yours or somebody else's. Facts can change. Truth is absolute, but facts change. Never blame death on God who is life. He doesn't just give life. He is life. Pam's dad, when he was only nine years old, his mother tragically passed away. The minister, who was supposed to be guiding and giving comfort to this family, told the little boy, this little nine-year-old boy, that God must have been lonely for his mama, and so he took her to be with him in heaven. Basically telling Pam's dad, this little boy, that God kills people when he gets lonely. What a foolish, Bible illiterate thing to say. Not only did this lie grow in this little boy's heart, but it created a deep mistrust and anger toward God. Pam's dad told me he felt angry as a boy, as a teenager. He felt angry, a distrust in God's character. Pam's dad eventually turned back to God's word. Thank God he did. And he got the truth on the inside of him. And he got set free from fear and all that anxiety. And he became a great minister and evangelist of hope, life, truth. He was such a fun, fun man. Too often, well-intended but foolish reasonings have created deadly lies misrepresenting God's character. God is not the killer, but the giver of life. Elijah the prophet, he had a time when he believed a lie. Think about this. Elijah in the Old Testament believed a lie, and it made him very afraid, very depressed, and even suicidal. Let me give you the backstory. Elijah is this great prophet of God. God talks to him and through him to nations of people. He's a heavy hitter. Elijah has this showdown with 850 false prophets of Baal who like to party with Jezebel. Elijah wins the contest because God shows up. So then he orders the execution of the 850 prophets. Immediately following that, God sends an abundance of rain, which ends the drought. But Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, she hears about her false prophets, all of her shopping buddies getting killed. She's not too happy. So she sends a threat to Elijah. Remember, it's a verbal threat to Elijah that he's as good as dead. That's what she says. Elijah starts to take the lie. He, he, he nurtures the lie in his heart and mind. He thinks about it over and over. He takes the lie. Fear comes in. Now, all of a sudden, he's discouraged, depressed, and now suicidal thoughts and words come to him. The lie overpowers Elijah, and he stops eating. He even stops drinking in the middle of the wilderness, and an angel has to come from God to help him. Let's pick up the story of 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. And God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, 
and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord, listen to this, but the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire a sound of gentle stillness and a still small voice. When Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? When you have no rest, when you're pursued, when you're being chased, you start cave shopping for a rest. Notice the cultural trend today for everybody wants a man cave or girls want a she shed and pursuit of isolation, escape, trying to get that rest just so that you can ease your mind. You're trying to even get a rest from your family. When Elijah answers, he says something interesting to God. He said, uh, he says, God, I'm the only one left who serves you, God. And now the king's army is searching to destroy me. Got to get me a man cave. That's what I'm doing here. I got me a man cave. Well, God answers Elijah back and he says, I still have 7,000 in Israel dedicated to me who have not bowed a knee down to those false gods. Elijah's perception was pretty skewed. Like I said, never build a doctrine on your experience or your perception of the events, never. Elijah had totally 100% believed a lie. He believed Jezebel's threat of death more than God's words of life. He believed he was alone. He believed he was forsaken and isolated. He, was, he said to God, I, I'm the only one. So isolation pursues more isolation. He was worried, he got anxious, he got stressed. He was sleep deprived. Elijah was a bona fide mess looking for a rest. <laughs> Are you a mess looking for a rest? Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28. He says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Rest. Signs and wonders don't cast down fear. Elijah had tons of signs and wonders, major signs and wonders, and he was still terrified. God can do wonders in your life, but that won't give you a good night's sleep. God can bless you. He can provide for you. He can chase every enemy away. But if you believe a lie on the inside, you will not be able to rest. The lie must be evicted and replaced with truth, God's truth. Until you know the truth, you can't be free. You won't enjoy the rest. I know lots of guys in the ministry, they don't have rest. Just because there's some stone in the shoe, some stone in the heart, perfect love casts down all fear. Did you know that God is love? So God casts down. God casts down. Look at 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear brings torment. So the one who is afraid is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. And again, I just want to let you know, don't be condemned if you feel like, well, I guess I'm just, I don't get love. I'm not perfected in love. No, no, don't, don't feel condemned or feel upset about this. God's telling you, you got more room for love. You got more rooms in your heart that need a love filling. Isn't that exciting? You can go to bed tonight with more love in your heart. You just got to evict the tenants that are in right now, which are probably lies and fear. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she wrote an amazing book called Who Switched Off My Brain? And she talks in her book about the brain's natural pharmacy. God has given the brain a natural pharmacy. God has given the brain a natural pharmacy. Isn't that wonderful? And it has the power to release biochemicals like endorphins and serotonin. The release of these biochemicals start a chain reaction that creates a positive environment where intellect flourishes, further promoting mental and physical health. That's what you want. When you give in to stress thinking, then you also release biochemicals, but not the good stuff. A chain reaction occurs. You begin to feel frustration, fear, anger, anxiety, bitterness. That destroys your physical health. It really does. 
Research tells us fear triggers more than 1,400 known physical and chemical responses. Because of this, your hormones and your neurotransmitters are negatively affected. The enemy strategy is to rob you of rest, hijack your thinking. It's tactical torture. Fear wants to steal your sleep so that the cerebral spinal fluid wash that God designed doesn't happen. He wants to sabotage your DNA genes with death. The enemy wants to import storms into your thoughts all day long and in the middle of the night. Have you ever had those thoughts in the middle of the night? Let's talk about another stormy sea that Jesus' disciples had. Jesus had just fed the multitudes miraculously. And then he instructs the disciples. He said, guys, get in the boat and go before me to the other side. Pretty straightforward, right? Get in the boat go before me to the other side. The problem is a huge storm comes up and it seems to be against the guys, against the disciples. This time, Jesus is not asleep in the boat, like in part three. Jesus is not in the boat. He's not in the boat, but he comes walking on the water. Remember that miracle? And of course, that put the boys at perfect ease and peace, right? Because the miraculous always calms everyone, doesn't it? It makes everybody just feel at peace and at ease. Oh, here comes Jesus walking on the water, right? No, 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 no. Let's look at what really happened. Matthew 14, starting at verse 26. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were, what? terrified. And they said, it is a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. Some translations say that they shrieked. <laughs> but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, what's he say? Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Don't allow it. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, well, come. I mean, obviously it's him. What else is he going to say? So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand and caught him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Can't we please just keep it simple, friends? Can we keep it simple? Jesus said, what did he say? What was the instruction? Get in the boat, go to the other side. It's very simple. Get in, get in the boat, go to the other side. Notice how Peter's water-walking, event-pursuing, conference-chasing experience, give me another sign and wonder pursuit, it slowed everybody down from getting what they really needed. It slowed the outcome of God's will and his purpose for their life. Believers are supposed to live by faith, not by chasing signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow those who believe right? Walk on water. Why? Why did Peter need to walk on the water? Invite Jesus into your boat and quit trying to prove that you can do it. It's not about you doing it. It's about what he's already done. It's all about Jesus. Stop laboring and enter into the rest. Quit trying to be super spiritual and supernatural. Be at peace and be at rest. John Maxwell said this, the famous author, he said, people who focus on their fears don't grow. They become paralyzed. How do we enter that rest? It's by faith, faith in him. But let me give you a very practical verse of scripture. Here we go, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Wow. This is how to live fear-free. Philippians 4, 8. 
This is how to do it. This is how to put up the no fear here sign in your life and allow the Holy Spirit to comfort you, to help you, to strengthen you, to activate God's word in your life. This is the practical that ignites the spiritual. Let me say it again. This is the practical that ignites the super spiritual. Here's the oil. Now you flip the switch. Faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith is the antithesis of fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7, I got to give it to you again. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of a sound mind. You have a spiritual legal right to God's amazing thoughts if you've received Jesus as your personal savior, you get to have God's thoughts and God's thoughts help you sleep. God wants to give you a rest. He wants you to take back your rest and you've got to have the no fear here sign up to take back your rest. You need Jesus in your life. So I want to pray two prayers for you. Let's start first. I want to make sure that you got Jesus in your heart. Pray this with me. Jesus, I ask you to be my savior. You died on the cross for me. You paid the price to redeem me from the curse. Forgive me of all my sins. You've been raised from the grave. I accept you into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. Amen. Wasn't that simple? You see, it's really about your faith and about his perfect work. It's really about you just believing his perfect work. Now. Let's deal with the fear because I want you to have a good night's sleep tonight. I want you to be able to rest. It's enough. It's time for you to be able to rest. So now let's pray together a no fear here prayer. This is important that you articulate this. Let me hear your words. You speak it out. Heavenly Father, I dedicate the arena of my mind to what is true and honorable. Whatever is right and pure, I choose to think on what is lovely and admirable. My mind is a no fear here zone dedicated to the glory of God. Thank you for reminding me that Jesus calls me to his rest. I honor you as I enter this rest. You remind me to obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. I access power in your word. I accept your unfailing love. I let go of all the fear and worry. Anxiety has to go right here at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.